This week we are starting off our Pride celebration by focusing on Pride fiction or LGBTQ plus fiction. Um, and we've got a, honestly, when I was making this list, it was a lot of fun looking at the cool titles. Like usually Laura gets really excited about this section. So she, I'm always surprised by what's pulled up, but it seems like there's a huge variety of genres this year and Laura and I always talk about how with LGBTQ books there was this big trend initially where it was like real stories about um, LGBTQ people and now it's kind of nice seeing that it's a story and they happen to be gay rather than it being all about them because that just means that there there's more of them it's great. It it's sort of like well when we went through that whole phase of like the teen issues novels and like mm -hmm. everything it wasn't just that you were a teenager but like there had to be something challenging going on yeah. yeah and then you know you can read this book when you're trying to deal with these situations yourselves and it's gonna help and it wasn't always the most fun reading yeah it's definitely like it's definitely a period that you have to go through I guess to make people see value in those kinds of stories until you're Maybe. able to do the fun stuff perhaps but either way i'm glad we're at the point now where we're getting to just read some fun stuff yeah it's, it's interesting you're right it's sort of it feels like it might be like a publishing growth cycle that we don't fully understand why it happens because we're like hey we'll read the books just like give us the books give us the stories and we're in yeah and speaking of that let's get right into it with yeah. blood debt by Terry J. Benton Walker. This is the first in a series. The series is also entitled Blood Debts. Um, all I'm going to say, like looking at the cover, not even looking at description yet, the cover, I'm going to say this is sort of like a mystery or like a magical fantasy type thing. Absolutely. There's a woman, a young woman in a ball, like gorgeous ball gown with a, a candle and just the way she's holding it and a young man holding a skull. So it looks like, and I mean, I'm, sorry, totally making gender guesses inappropriately here based on wardrobe, but let's get into it. And it says justice will reign on the title. Mm -hmm. 30 years ago, a young woman was murdered. A family was lynched and new Orleans saw the greatest magical massacre in its history. In the days that followed a throne was stolen from a queen on the anniversary of these brutal events, Clement and Christina Trudeau, the 16 year old twin heirs to the powerful magical dethroned family are mourning their father and caring for their sick mother until by chance they discover that their mother isn't sick she's cursed cursed by someone on the very magic council their family used to rule someone who will come for them next christina once a talented and dedicated practitioner of generational magic has given up magic for good an ancient spell is what killed their father and she was the one who cast it for clement magic is his lifeline a distraction from his anger and pain even better than the random guy he hooks up with. Christina and Clement used to be each other's most trusted confidant and friend. Now they barely speak. But if they have any hope of discovering who is coming after their family, they'll have to find a way to trust each other and their family's magic, all while solving the decades-old murder that sparked the still rising tensions between the city's magical and non-magical communities. And if they don't succeed, New Orleans may see another massacre, or worse. So my assumptions weren't wrong about the people on the covers, but I still think it's a good reminder to ourselves yeah especially um, with this episode <laughs> exactly yeah but it's just in general right there's there's a real change in like cover art and and all of these assumptions that we've sort of carried for a long time and also sometimes what to expect like I said magical I was right this time <laughs> but you know yeah could have been a whole sci-fi bringing back the dead thing who knows I do think it's interesting that they don't mention and maybe this is a misunderstanding of that I have, but I'm surprised with New Orleans that there is no mention of what kind of magic they're using. Cause I mm -hmm. think a lot of times they mention now I can't even remember. It's not, it's not voodoo, is it? That's not the kind of magic that they do. There's a specific word for the kind of magic that's done in New Orleans. And I can't remember um, what it is. I mean, I think traditionally my recollection is it was following like voodoo. Um, well, Haitian voodoo. Like, okay, maybe that's what I was thinking. I of. think that's probably what you were thinking of. Oh, but says, I do think it's what's the a name? Really... 
It says, what is the name? I just Googled New Orleans magic name. What's the name of the witch from New Orleans? The most famous voodoo queen was Mary Laveau. So yeah. maybe. So also is. voodoo from the, but I think maybe a slightly different strain. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But I'm surprised here that because it's specifically mentioning New Orleans, that it's not mentioning voodoo as well. So I'm curious how, like, if that's addressed at all in the book, because Seems like yeah, and I mean, it's come. interesting. I mean, it's, you know, described as a contemporary fantasy. But as we've learned in so many other novels, it their New Orleans may not be exactly our New Orleans. True. Right? Yeah. So they may have, and especially once you bring in magic, you don't have to bring in the magic that people automatically think of for an area. Right. Because here they talk about generational magic. Um, yeah, but and it looks like generational magic isn't the only kind of magic so i think benton walker is maybe going in a different direction here um mm -hmm. and perhaps like deliberately keeping out um like our pre preconceived notions about new orleans and voodoo that would make sense that would make sense i like that okay we'll, we'll go with that until we read it yeah someone please tell me what what's going on there because yeah you're right general me it's capitalized general generational magic so it's got mm -hmm. to be its own type interesting this next one mostly picked because of the cover and then when i was reading the description of it i was like wow uh i love this this is in nightfall by suzanne young love the cover uh in the quaint town of nightfall oregon it isn't the dark you should be afraid of it's the girls the Lost Boys meet Buffy the Vampire Slayer in this propulsive novel from New York Times bestselling author of The Treatment, which I've never read. Uh, Theo and her brother Marco threw the biggest party of the year and got caught. Their punishment? Leave Arizona. That seems <laughs> drastic. <laughs> uh, to spend the summer with their grandmother in the rainy beachside town of Nightfall, Oregon. Population 846 souls. The small town is cute when it's not raining. But their grandmother is superstitious and strangely antisocial. Upon their arrival, she lays out uh, the one house rule. Always be home before dark. But Theo and Marco are determined to make the most of their summer. And on their first day, they meet the enigmatic Minnow and her friends. Beautiful and charismatic, the girls have a magnetic pull that Theo and her brother can't resist. But Minnow and her friends are far from what they appear. And that one rule... Theo quickly realizes she should have listened to her grandmother because after dark, something emerges in nightfall and it doesn't plan to let her leave. Ooh. So, it's, so cool. Well, I know it's interesting. Our first two books are our sibling stories, um, kind of tying in with our last episode. Of, <gasps> yeah. Where we said there was none. <laughs> I know. And now we're, we're all about siblings. Um, yeah. I agree. The cover art on this is super cool. It did make me think of the original Buffy the Vampire Slayer the first time I saw it. Yeah. So. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds very, yeah. It just sounds really cool. Like those are the cool kids, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm... I also find it interesting. It's a population of 846 souls. Yeah. Very. Are similar. all of those souls attached to uh, bodies? Or perhaps it's, are they all humans? Exactly. There's a lot of questions about these souls. Yeah. I will say, I should mention that this episode includes a lot of books that are, some of them are available in the actual library collection. Some of them are only available on Cloud Library right now. So if you can't find them in our collection, head online to Cloud Library and you can find them there. Like this one specifically is. This Not in the physical. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. If you're looking for In Nightfall, look on Cloud Library as opposed to our physical collection. If you're going to want to check out Imogen, obviously, our next title, by Becky Albertalli, you'll find it in the physical collection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Imogen Scott may be hopelessly heterosexual, but she's got the world's greatest ally title locked down. Oh, man, this girl, I feel like, already has a huge ego. <laughs> um she's never missed a pride alliance meeting she knows more about queer media discourse than her very queer little sister she even has two queer best friends there's gretchen a fellow high school senior who helps keep imogen's biases in check and then there's lily newly out and newly thriving with a new a cool new squad of queer college friends that was a mouthful <laughs> Imogen's thrilled for Lily, any ally, uh, any ally would be. And now that she's finally visiting Lily on campus, she's bringing her ally A-game. 
any support Lily needs, Imogen's all in. Even if that means bending the truth just a little. Like when Lily drops a tiny queer bombshell, she's told other college friends that Imogen and Lily used to date, and none of them know that Imogen is a raging hetero. <laughs> Not even Lily's best friend, Tessa. Of course, the more time Imogen spends with chaotic, freckle-faced Tessa, the more she starts to wonder if her truth was ever all that straight to begin with. Ooh, this is cute. Figuring out who you are. Yeah, and like, I kind of like that it's figuring out who you are later in your life. Like, this is late high school. I think a lot of stories start off with the character realizing that they're Mm. queer to some extent, but there's not very many that show how you can like you don't learn everything about yourself right away and I think it's normal for a lot of people to come to those realizations later in life so it's kind of cute seeing that in a book for some people it's even like much much later Mm -hmm. I think this is interesting too because often in these sorts of narratives you'll have a character who has never quite fit in things have never quite felt right and obviously like Imogen very confident in who she is mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's it looks very sweet I'm pretty sure Becker Becky Al- Albertelli wrote another book about a um a non-binary character I want to say can't mm, I can't remember the title of it but they they've written a couple books that are pretty well known and they're a very good author um this next author ft lukens also wrote um in deeper waters and then the sequel to it which is called this is ever after which is basically gay pirates which is fantastic (laughs) (laughs) but this one is magic so this is called spellbound uh edison rooker isn't sure what to expect when he enters the office of antonia hex the powerful sorceress who runs a call center for magical emergencies he doesn't have much experiences with hexes or curses heck he doesn't even have magic but he does have a plan to regain the access to the magical world he lost when his grandmother passed antonia is intimidating but she gives him a job and a new name rook both of which he's happy to accept Now, all Rook has to do is keep his spellbinder, an illegal magic detection device, hidden from the magical consortium, and contend with Sun, the grumpy and annoyingly cute apprentice to Antonio's rival colleague, Fable. But dealing with uh, competition isn't so bad, as Sun seems to pop up more and more, and Rook minds less and less. But when the consortium gets wind of Rook's spellbinder, they come for Antonia. All alone, Rook runs to the only other magical person he knows, Sun. Except Fable has also been attacked, and now Rook and Sun have no choice but to work together to get their mentors back, or face losing their magic forever. So very cute. Seems Mm -hmm. kind of um, akin to um, Rainbow Rowell's um, Carry On series with the Simon Snow. so if you liked that, I would check it out. And the cover is just beautiful. I really like it. There's a really nice variety in these covers too, eh? Yeah. Some of them have, I mean, a lot of them have a very like kind of vintagey throwback, but to different times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like this, even the, the next one, I really like the shading that they've mm-hmm. chosen. It's very, yeah, very pink. I like it. And... On that note, our next one is called (laughs) Sizzle Reel uh, by Carlin Greenwald. And yeah, it is a lovely cover. The outfits have sort of like an 80s throwback feel to Mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Um, And lots of pink for our our dear pink friend over there, Miss Nicole. Covers to match your hair. (laughs) Um, For aspiring cinematographer Luna Roth, coming out as bisexual at 24 is proving more difficult than she anticipated. Sure, her best friend and fellow queer Romy is thrilled for her, but she has no interest in coming out to her backwards parents. She wouldn't know how to flirt with a girl if one fell at her feet, and she has no sexual history to build off. Not to mention, she really needs to focus her energy on escaping her emotionally abusive, but that's Hollywood talent manager boss, and actually get working under a real director or photographer anyway. So she's got a lot going on. Yeah, this is definitely a new adult one. Where Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But and just so much going on in her life, right? Trying to figure out multiple major parts of her life all at once. No kidding. Yeah. 
Uh, when she meets 28-year-old A-list actress Valeria Sullivan around the office, Luna thinks she's found her solution. She'll use Valeria's interest in her cinematography to get a PA job on the set of Valeria's directorial debut. And if Valeria is as gay as Luna suspects, and she happens to be Luna's route to losing her virginity too, well, that's just an additional <laughs> bonus. <laughs> Enlisting Romy's help, Luna starts the juggling act of her life. Impress Valeria's DP to get another job after this one, get as close to Valeria as possible, and help Romy with her own career moves. But when Valeria begins to reciprocate romantic interest in Luna, the act begins to crumble, straining her relationship with Romy and leaving her job prospects precarious. Now Luna has to figure out if she can fulfill her dreams as a filmmaker, keep her best friend, and get the girl. Or if she's just destined to end up on the cutting room floor. Ooh, like you said, lots going on there. Well, That's they always tell thing. you, you know, don't try to do too many big things in your life at once. <laughs> yeah, this is like a very, when they say new adult, I think this is exactly what they mean. Like high school romance and is so different from even university and post mm -hmm. university romance. It's, it's, I'm, I'm happy to see that the new adult section keeps growing because um, all the YA readers are growing with it. <laughs> right. And I mean, this, and this is such a good example because that was exactly what popped in my head. I'm like, oh, we've got a new adult. Yeah. There are so many books that there's so many books that are kind of like, is it new adult? Is it women's fiction? Like, yeah. where does it really fall? Whereas I think this one is actually pretty um, clear. Yeah. Which yeah. doesn't mean that other people can't read it. Of course. We do not have to fit into the new adult age category to enjoy <laughs> fiction of, for all, right? Yeah. Uh, this next one is in the adult fiction section. Uh, this is Chain Gang All-Stars by Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya. Uh, love the cover. Um, I believe... What was I going to... Anyways, I'll read the description. Two top women gladiators fight for their freedom within a depraved private prison system not so far removed from America's own. Loretta Thurwar and Hamara Hurricane Stacks Stacker mm -hmm. are the star, uh, stars of the Chain Gang All-Stars, the cornerstone of CAPE, or Criminal Action Penal Entertainment, a highly popular, highly controversial profit-raising program in America's increasingly dominant private prison industry it's the return of gladiators and prisoners it's the return of the gladiators and prisoners are competing for the ultimate prize their freedom in cape uh, c-a-p-e prisoners tra uh, travel as links in chain gangs competing in death matches for packed arenas with righteous protesters at the gates thurwar and Stax, both teammates and lovers are the fan favorites and if all goes well Thurwell will be free in just a few matches, a fact she carries as heavily as her lethal hammer. As she prepares to leave her fellow Lynx, she considers how she might help preserve their humanity in defiance of these so-called games. But Cape's corporate owners will stop at nothing to protect their status quo, and the obstacles they lay in Thurwar's path have devastating consequences. Moving from the Lynx, in the field to the protesters, to the Cape employees, and beyond, Chain Gang All-Stars is a kaleidoscopic excoriating i don't know what that means uh look at the america's look at look at the american prison system's unholy alliance of who <laughs> systemic racism unchecked capitalism and mass incarceration and a clear-eyed reckoning with what freedom in this country really means so this one obviously is future world kind of thing but very grounded in what's currently happening in the real world and it's really not... like ties in with some like older sci-fi films and stuff yeah like it is a, it's it's not a new theme it's just being handled i think differently yeah um excoriate is to censure or criticize severely oh okay there you go yeah okay. this one sounds really um yeah, I, I don't know. This one sounds really interesting to me. It's it. I'm I can't I'm I, this is nowhere near the same, but it feels very Hunger Games in like the final um, you're working with your partner slash lover to mm -hmm. win this death match. And will anybody be able to come out alive or only one of you? So it's and yeah. like what damage will occur as a result. Yeah. And it's very political 
It feels mm-hmm. like an older Hunger Games because Hunger Games is YA, but right, obviously very different, but same vibe to me, same seriousness almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds good. Not very interesting. You got all the big words in it too. Mm-hmm. In that description. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so next up, we'll see if this is, I mean, that's probably the heaviest book we've talked about so far. Like, mm-hmm. that's a little intense, a little yeah. dystopian. Yeah. Um, so this one is If I See You Again Tomorrow by Robbie Couch. You know, we're getting a lot of really, really lovely color covers, a lot of, like, pink hues mm-hmm. in this um, particular episode. And this one's got some, like, lovely pinks and peaches. Um, and like cartoony Mm -hmm. to a certain degree people but really nicely drawn agreed so getting into it from the author of sky blues and blame for the wind comes a speculative young adult romance about a teen stuck in a time loop that's endlessly monotonous until he meets the boy of his dreams and i'm gonna fess up like this cover i did not expect speculative fiction i know but i'm here for it i know For some reason, Clark has woken up and relived the same monotonous Monday. Oh, it had to be a Monday. 309 (laughs) times. Until day three turns out out to be different. Suddenly, his usual torturous math class is interrupted by an anomaly. A boy he's never seen before in all his previous Mondays. When shy, reserved Clark decides to throw caution to the wind and join effusive and effervescent bow on a series of errands across the Windy City, he never imagines that anything will really change, because nothing has in such a long time. And he doesn't definitely doesn't expect to fall this hard or this fast for someone in just one day. There's just one question. How do you build a future with someone if you can never get to tomorrow? very very interesting i always Mm -hmm. like a time loop they're they're fascinating yeah yeah it's uh like and can they you know is it going to be about getting out of the time loop is it about being like as long as bo's in the loop it's gonna be a fun monday forever (laughs) we shall see the resolution will be interesting Uh, This next one is called The 99 Boyfriends of Micah Summers by Adam Sass. Uh, Will Boy 100 be the one? Micah is rich, dreamy, and charming. As the Prince of Chicago, the son of local celebrity sports radio host known as the King of Chicago, he has everything going for him. Unfortunately, he's also the Prince of Imaginary Meat Cutes since he's too nervous to actually ask boys out. Instead, Micah draws each crush to see, uh, to share on Instagram with a post about their imaginary dates. 99 boyfriends later, his account is hugely popular and everyone is eagerly awaiting Boy 100. So is Micah. He's determined that Boy 100 will be different. This time, Micah will sweep the boy off his feet for real. So when Micah flirts with a hot boy on the L, I don't, oh, that's um the elevated trains in Chicago. Yeah who's wearing a vegan leather jacket and lugging a ton of library books. Woohoo, we love him. <laughs> sure, this is boy 100. But right before he can make his move and ask for the boy's number, the guy rushes off the train, leaving behind his pumpkin embroidered jacket. Cute. Uh, the jacket holds clues to the boy's identity, so Micah and his friends set off on a quest to return it. Along the way, Micah will discover that the best relationships aren't fairy tales. In fact, the perfect fit and true love might be closer than he thinks. Sounds like he might fall in love with a friend. Really does. Love that. Maybe a bestie who becomes more than a bestie. Sounds like it. Very cute. Mm -hmm. Well, he's obsessed with meat cutes, right? Yeah. It should go in a cute direction. I like that. I will say this (laughs) next one. These next two made me super excited. (laughs) Well, then we better get into Out of the Blue by Jason June. Uh, Another fun cover. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm gonna go with this is gonna have like a fantasy a little bit piece. yeah so Crest is not excited to be on their journey the month-long sojourn on land all teen merfolk must undergo the rules are simple help a human with within one moon cycle and return to Pacifica to become an elder or fail and remain remain stuck on land forever and all I can think about is the little mermaid right now 
Yeah. And I want to go where the people go. For for the listeners who don't see the cover, there is a mermaid on the cover. (laughs) And we have been talking about teen merfolk so far. Yes. Yeah. Um, But it's interesting because Crest doesn't want to go, right? Mm -hmm. Crest is eager to get their journey over and done with. After all, humans are disgusting. They've polluted the planet so much that there's a floating island of trash that's literally the size of a country. In Los Angeles, with a human body and a new name, Crest meets Sean, a human lifeguard whose boyfriend has recently dumped him. Crest agrees to help Sean make his ex jealous and win him back. This does not seem like a major helping a human thing, but okay. I mean, it's a simple rule. <laughs> it is It is a very simple rule. I thought it was going to be like, you know, you have to do something a little more elaborate, but fine. Okay, we're, we're going to work to make the ex jealous and win him back. But as the two spend more time together and Crest's perspective on humans begins to change, they'll soon be torn between two worlds and fake dating just might lead to real feelings, which is always a risk. I think we've learned that in many books before. Yep. Yeah. Very sweet. Yeah. I'm curious what the ultimate decision will be. Will they stay together for long? Who knows? Yeah. And can humans like do the reverse and go beneath can they good question you know you have a mer body yeah i'll also say based solely off the cover it i'm really happy to see so many times covers well honestly just in books there's not very much um size inclusivity uh Mm -hmm. so to see the main love interest be not this like clearly the merman is very like svelte and the mm-hmm. love interest is not. It's um it's nice to see because people deserve to see themselves in books. No, it's a more uh, realistic body, like Yeah. Not the super buff teen romance cover. Exactly. Model. Yeah. 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 Like all the other covers. Very slender. But this one, yeah, it's nice to see some body inclusivity. I mm-hmm. like it. Uh, perfect example is this next cover just two teen boys prime of their lives this is a little bit country by brian d kennedy which looks good (laughs) i will judge a book by its cover okay emmett mcguire wants to be a country music no wants to be country music's biggest gay superstar a far reach when you're 17 and living in illinois but for now he's happy to do the next best thing stay with his aunt in Jackson Hollow, Tennessee for the summer and perform at the amusement park owned by his idol, country music legend Wanda Jean Stubbs. Luke Barnes hates country music. As the grandson of Verna Rose, the disgraced singer, who had a famous falling out with Wanda Jean. Luke knows how much pain country music has brought his family. But when his mom's medical bills start piling up, he takes a job at the last place he wants, a, r- a restaurant at Wanda World which is the amusement park. Neither boy is looking for romance, so it sparks fly when they meet, and soon they're inseparable, until a long-lost secret about Verna and Wanda comes to light, threatening to unravel everything. Will Emmett and Luke be able to get past the truths they discover, or will will their relationship go down in history as just another sad country love song? Aww. Yeah, very cute. I'm so curious what the history is with the two aunts because who knows maybe that's got some lgbtq spice in it as well i don't know Mm. either way it's interesting too when we go through some of these books like this one as we're looking at the description i'm like this one i can see being a movie yeah it's got that really heavy visuals for some reason that just come out of the text as Mm -hmm. this like i can see it being mapped out really well in some yeah. ways better than the new adult one where she's actually working in cinema. This just sort of screams like, make me a screenplay. <laughs> make it happen. Yeah. 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 It's the, I mean, honestly, all of these books look really good. And I think next week um, we're going to do a comics, LGBTQ mm. comics that are out. That'll be fun. Yeah. Cause there's a whole bunch of good ones. And those ones we have, I think one or two children's ones and, um they say children's i mean juvenile and right. then middle grade depending on what you want to call it and then higher up so very very good um i think i'm gonna wrap up the episode are you ready 
I'm ready. I'll come see you in person in a minute. <laughs> Yay. Uh, okay. So thank you again for everybody for listening. I hope you liked this episode. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. We are at TBAPL on all socials. Um, and you can find our show notes at www.tbplofftheshelf.com in case you miss titles or want to see the images if you're a listener. And uh, we'll So many good you- images. Yes, the covers are really good this episode. Uh, But yeah, we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye.